everyone. Uh, can I have your attention? Um, it's, it's my great pleasure to, to be here at the Sam Bulls uh, lecture after a long uh, three years of not having this type of event. It's really uh, great uh, to be able to uh, kind of relaunch uh, the uh, Sam Bulls uh, uh, lecture and to kind of recognize and honor Sam's contributions to shaping uh, the unique character of the UMass uh, Economic uh, Department uh, through the, the years. And the great news is that Sam's actually, <laughs> actually here. <laughs> <laughs> So, so for me, this is a little trippy because um, Sam was my dissertation advisor, um, and uh, now I'm chair of the department introducing uh, the Sam Bulls uh, uh, lecture. And our speaker today, Juan Camila uh, Cardenas, uh, was um, in graduate school with me. Different programs, but um, we, we, we overlapped. And so it's kind of a full circle uh, uh, type of, uh, of moment. Um, I had a bunch of comments trying to link, you know, draw the parallels between Juan Camilo's work and Sam's work, uh, but we've asked Sam to actually introduce uh, Juan Camilo <laughs> and, and make those connections uh, himself. So c come on up, Sam. <laughs> well, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm always so happy to be uh, at UMass and uh, to see everybody here uh, who I know and even some who I don't. Uh, uh, I won't say much about the connection between my work and Juan Camila's. I think it's, it will be pretty obvious uh, as, he, as he goes along. Um, I'll say something about the, this uh, lecture series. Um, uh, when I first heard about it, it was called the Sam Bowles Memorial Lecture. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, uh, I, I don't know quite how that got into the email, but uh, I, uh, I didn't object to that, actually. I was so, I was so pleased to, to, be, to be honored. In fact, I didn't notice that it kind of, the connotations weren't so great. Um, but I was uncomfortable, uh, seriously, at having uh, I mean, this honor. It's, it's really quite a, an honor, and um, I, uh, I was pleased with it. Uh, but uh, I, I've never had anything named for me, except that my uh, daughter named her dog uh, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> and I think that was, I mean, I was very happy that she named her dog Sam. But uh, you know, who knows what was really going on, you know, between daughter and father and dog and so on. Uh, the, um, uh, I could tell you fantastic stuff about Juan Camilo, uh, but I won't bother to tell you what you can find out by just going online and looking at his massive CV, uh, many, many pages. Uh, but I do want to say a few things about, uh, about him as a human being and as a scholar. Um, as, as you already know, he has a PhD from UMass in, in ResEC, in environmental uh, and ResEC. Um, he was a student with, uh, uh, with me. Uh, uh, he's uh, one of the many survivors of Economic 700. Uh, and many, many are in the room. Some, some are in the room, and all of you in the room who are taking 700, I'm sure, will survive. Um, he, uh, over the course of the last uh, quarter of a century, almost quarter of a century, um, uh, since he got his degree here, um, he's been a visitor at Harvard, also at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, he was also a visitor for a MacArthur uh, foundation network in behavioral economics. It included some of the top people in behavioral economics, including Kahneman and Fair uh, and, and, and many others. Um, the, um, I think one of the big influences on his development was Eleanor Ostrom, and he spent time at the uh, University of Indiana uh, with uh, Ostrom and was also co-author with her. Um, his, uh, his contributions to behavioral economics and environmental economics are really quite distinctive. Uh, remember, 20 years ago, what we were doing in behavioral economics is we were getting a lot of stuff published by essentially saying homo economicus is wrong, and there were many different ways to do that, and it was kind of low-hanging fruit, and you could get stuff published by running an experiment and showing that people didn't consistently act in a selfish manner. Uh, and that was all done in labs and with students. Uh, there, there are two things I think is really impressive about what Juan Camila did, and I'll tell you why he did it in a minute. But what he did was right from the beginning, he wanted to ask, oh, if what we're learning from behavioral economics is really true, 
how should we do economics differently? He, so he, he took it from being something which was a kind of exciting but kind of boutique field of cool results showing that homo economicus was wrong into saying, how can we use this knowledge so as to better organize our societies, particularly uh, in, in ways that are sustainable and which attend the needs of the least well off? He immediately made that step, and I hope more and more people are making that, because I think it's time we, we accepted the fact that the behavioral re revolution has happened, and now we have to think of what does that imply about other things in economics. Um, at one of those MacArthur Foundation meetings, I think it was in Chicago, um, we had a conversation, and Juan Camilo asked me, uh, I mean, he'd, he'd enjoyed, uh, as you can tell from what I'm t telling you, he had enjoyed being very connected to a really exciting group of scholars uh, in, in those years. And he said he was returning to go back to, to, uh, to Columbia uh, because he thought that's where he should put his energies to try to help the problems of uh, his country. And he said sort of wistfully to me, does that mean that I'll probably eventually get, lose my connections with these networks uh, and um, will that be kind of the end of this tight relationship I have with these people? And I said, sadly, probably yes. Because I'd seen it happen again and again. People return to some place where the airfares are a little high and maybe you're not at conferences so people don't notice you so much. And you don't get invited and it's kind of, um, um, you kind of get dropped out of the networks. And, um, so he understood what he was doing. But then something really amazing happened. He wrote a couple of papers that really got a lot of attention because they were super good papers. And he took off like a rocket. Uh, and so he showed me wrong. Uh, and in fact, uh, f for the next few years, I mean, I couldn't track him. He was always traveling somewhere to give a lecture or a workshop or a seminar and so on. In other words, he succeeded in going back to Colombia to serve the interests of the people of Colombia and also to maintain his status as one of the real uh, stars in the behavioral uh, economics um, community. Um, let me close with uh, this. Uh, most people do experiments and do some kind of behavioral work uh, thinking about their job market paper. Uh, and where am I gonna put this thing? He started doing experiments as a community organizer. He wasn't thinking about publishing things. He was thinking about how to teach people how to cooperate so that they didn't suffer the environmental damages of their behaviors. Uh, and he found out along the way oh my God, you can publish these things. Uh, and he got really good at it. And so he, uh, his success was, I, I think, because he's very, very good at what he does. He started it because he was interested in changing the lives of ordinary people. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Juan Camila. Wow. With with those words from Sam, I mean, it's, it's moving and, 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 and humbling to, to hear that from a person that has taught you so much as what Sam has taught me over all these years. Um, and, and, and this lecture, I hope, is also reflecting all that learning that I have received from, from, from Sam over these years and the legacy because he is one of the keystone parts of all this uh, revolution, if you want to call it, yes, in the in the behavioral sciences from the side of economics, but in the in the in the side and in the objectives and in the purposes of what I'm going to try to to talk today, and 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 hearing some uh, hearing him say those words are just very very moving for me, and and thank you, Sam, because they really mean a lot to me. I mean, this is, this is like a treat. I mean, we're close to, to trick or treat evening, <laughs> Halloween. Um, I, I put my costume on a little bit earlier than that evening. But today, getting this introduction remarks from Sam, having the opportunity of giving the Sam Bowles lecture, uh, coming from 
class just half an hour ago uh, that I teach, which is Political Economy of the Environment, uh, traditionally taught by Jim Boyce and other of the people that I appreciate and love enormously but because he also taught me so much about environmental economics. And then this morning teaching another course, Behavioral Economics, uh, and seeing some of my students of that class sitting here. I, I don't need more candies for trick or treating. <laughs> Um, I'm done. I'm, I'm filled with, with joy and, and with, uh, with energy to do this. Um, also because this, um, this, this, is, this is an important series of events. When, when you look at the, at the people who, who have given this lecture before, uh, people that, that I admire, people that I read, people that I have uh, uh, learned also, um, it's, it's challenging and, and it's also uh, gives you some, some extra uh, energy to, to continue and, and see how you can maintain this, this legacy of Sam and, and his work. Um, and hopefully the next one we will all be here in person and hopefully also enjoying uh, the reception and some drinks and some chat which we all gain from. And that idea of getting together is a lot about what I'm going to try to talk today about these, these behavioral issues. Um, and yes, it's going to be about revolutions. I don't have to talk about revolutions coming from a country that just released its Truth Commission report. Um, the Truth Commission report uh, from the, um, one of the longest uh, conflict periods in time with one of the longest attempts by a leftist Marxist a revolutionary group to try to to win over the government and 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 ending with numbers that are just terribly uh, saddening. Uh, we can talk about 7.7 .7 million people displaced because of the violence, according to this report, just between 1985 and 2018. And, more than 50,000 people kidnapped over that process by many of these groups. Um, 121,000 people disappearing over that period of time. 450,000 people assassinated uh, over that period of time. So this is when, when, when you ask yourself about what is the purpose of revolutions and what is the purpose of changing the system. Um, so it is familiar for me because over that period of time between the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s, I have seen the whole process from attempts to failures to a peace process and then sitting down with the revolutionary groups, turning their weapons in and trying to build a peace process that hopefully is durable and then seeing with some hope that, that maybe some other changes can be happening in other ways. And now we have a new government for the first time, a leftist government in office for the first time in the history of Colombia. And that is exciting and at the same time confusing because many things are happening at the same time and it's hard to tell what is going to happen from that. But maybe that could be another type of different revolution in that sense. So the, the idea of, of the title of the talk came from hearing about this album, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, uh, that maybe some of you may have heard. And, and then there came this graffiti that the revolution was not going to be televised, it was going to be tweeted, and then another uh, graffiti saying that the revolution was not going to be tweeted, so how is going to be the revolution? And uh, that's part of that. And I have been part of the behavioral revolution, and, 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 and thanks to some words uh, reflecting on that, but basically I feel like a child of the behavioral revolution, because I have learned from all these people uh, that started this learning from the origins in the 1950s, Herbert Simon, but from on and on, and then Kahneman, Tversky, and then on and on. And I, and I feel like I am a, a child or a grandchild of those giants that changed all these foundations, assumptions, modeling theories, and policy implications that came from that. Um, this behavioral revolution questioned assumptions severely, and as Sam said, Maybe it was a low-hanging fruit, but some people took it faster and, and made important contributions in questioning the assumptions in economics. It changed the methods, incredibly highly so, because it changed the way we could think of economics as a science that could be experimental. That was very novel to say in the history of 
200 or 250 years of, of a discipline, to say that it could be an experimental discipline definitely changed the methods. The methods of going and looking and seeing what actual humans do instead of making assumptions of what they do. Um, it changed theories, of course, and now we have many more better theories to explain this behavior of humans. Um, and it began to change also policies in, in several ways. And many of these applications of changes in policies came with this package of what has been called nudging, which has been intriguing to me in, in several ways, and I'm going to talk about that several ways. Um, but there was something else going on in my mind that, uh, that has been happening, probably motivated by also what Sam said, which was this decision to, to go back to Colombia after getting my, my graduate training in this amazing university. Because that training came not only from the Resource Economics Department, but from the Econ Department. I mentioned Carmen Deer, I took classes with her, uh, Jim Boyce, but also Sam, who was in my committee and who was a main advisor into the whole process in my, in my committee. And Sam was the very first one supporting me with this crazy idea of replicating experiments, but in the field, and nobody was doing that at the time. And he was saying, go ahead, go for it, and help me even finding funding to, to do that and jump into the river and, and swim those strange and uncharted territories of, of doing experiments in the field. But probably since then, I keep wondering something. And it's a disconnect that, that, that makes me always ask what's going on. And this disconnect has to do with the idea that, of course, we find that people are kind. We are not surprised at that now. And we have lots of support that people are kind, people are honest, people are fair. They are cooperative. They are willing to invest costly resources to punish others, to maintain social norms, uh, to reduce inequalities. They dislike unfairness. Um, and we have done this the whole thing, theory, modeling, simulations, archaeology, paleontology. Sam has worked with collaborators from so many disciplines in uh, realizing that this is something that we know it is in the workings and in the nature of humans. And um, this has been supported by many other methods uh, from MRIs, neuroscientists, all the way, as I said, to paleontological evidence on how all these mechanisms work. And yet, at the macro level, we keep finding that deforestation continues um, to, to, to destroy, let's say, the Amazon. Um, and in the aggregate, carbon emissions continue to rise. I wrote a paper right at the beginning, the first half of the pandemic. Uh, the United Nations asked me to write a report if we could find some hopeful signals from the learnings of the pandemic. And I wrote that it's nice to see people appreciating uh, wildlife coming into the cities, like if they were not there. They have been always there, but hiding from humans. And now that humans were not there, they just showed up, and now we paid more attention. Um, and, and they asked me to write something hopeful in the sense of, are we going to change our, our, our behaviors? Are we going to change from a behavioral standpoint? Are we going to really learn from this and, and appreciate the improvement in the quality of air? Are we going to appreciate better biodiversity and the like? And I wrote something like that. like like two years ago, less than two years ago, hoping for those better behaviors. And yet, we are looking at carbon emissions still in the same patterns and with all this energy crisis. And now we are seeing not much changing in the aggregate. And, but also in the aggregate, we're seeing the, the issues of corruption. And, and yet, we find that most people are honest. And, and we continue to see waste of valuable public resources. And, and then you wonder why people like fairness and they enjoy these different things. And poverty and inequality remain high in many parts of the world, acknowledging that some parts of the world have been very effective in reducing in some parts more poverty, reducing poverty than inequality. But this is something that has been always in my mind. Why, do, if at the micro we see this, it doesn't, have to, it doesn't happen at the aggregate? And what are we going to do about it from the behavioral uh, point of view and the experimental tools? So what are, what are we missing in that sense? And then two papers came and sort of made me think about this, this lecture and, and hopefully a paper. And, and these two recent papers may have some clues to, to get us on the same page in the facts about what is happening. Uh, one of them has to do with a vast data set that more or less support that most of these nudges have very small or even null effects when seen in perspective. 
And this is a paper by the Lavinia and Linus published in Econometrica this year. So they took data from 126 randomized trials, about 23 million people participating in this. So this is a, a large representation. It's not like a few hundred people in the lab. This is lots of people um, represented in this sample. And what they find is that, in general, the effects of these nudges, uh, when they have tried to implement one of these little pushes to get people doing the right thing, are having very small effects. And also, the two graphs on the left and the right have also shown something that is even more interesting, which is the policy question. The graph in the left are the effects that they have been finding in papers that have been published in academic journals, in, in good, recognizable academic journals. And maybe it is an issue of publication bias, which we all are aware of, and that, that makes more salient these papers that find some effect. But then the graph on the right shows the effects of nudges that have been implemented by these so-called nudge units, which are these behavioral insight units that they have putting together in so many countries around the world. So most governments got excited with this, and you will see in a second why. They got excited, and they began to implement all these nudges, and then they put together this data set, and with a few, few handful of cases, uh, most of them just show no results. And so that, that should make you wonder about this, um, this particular idea that we can use these behavioral insights to get people to do the right thing. And again, remember my disconnect, especially thinking about environmental issues, that if we need to change the environment, and we need to change at the aggregate level major things. And yet, all these traits that humans have that are demonstrated in the lab and in the field over and over at the micro level in the aggregate are not happening, and, and that's the open question that I have. So that's one point. But the second point, so that's one point. Not just might not be having such an impactful effects. They are very small. But the second one is, uh, what if these nudges are distracting us from thinking about the aggregate levels? Uh, which is the point by this recent paper by Chatter and Lowenstein, including both of them important figures in the behavioral area, in the behavioral community. And they themselves in the paper, um, that is now going to be published soon, uh, acknowledge that, that they have been part of that. And, and I think I, I have been also, and I am going to plead guilty in a second in, in an example of these kind of things. And they are putting for us a framework that I like of thinking about this discussion, which they call the I-frame and the S-frame. So let me go in detail into what they mean by that, because I think it's, it's going to be uh, important for putting this together. So I'm going to use their own words. They will call I-frame the neural and cognitive machinery that underpins their thoughts and behaviors, the thoughts and behaviors of humans. Okay. So this is what they call the I-frame. And then they're going to call the S-frame the system of rules, norms, and institutions by which we live. Okay? In many ways, the 4Cs course, the Econ 700 course, is all about these two things interacting together. Um, and I learned most of what I have been doing thinking out of those 4Cs in that particular course. Uh, because it's about that interaction between the, the human nature and the surrounding of that human interactions, but especially social interactions. The social exchange of individuals surrounded by this set of norms, institutions, rules, formal and informal. And of course, Sam mentioned the work with Eleanor Ostrom that will come in a second handy here for that, because that was one more piece of, of major influence to try to respond to this critique that Charter and Lowenstein have. So what they claim is that these I-frame policies, policies aimed at the I-frame, are about changing behavior without changing the system, okay? Without changing the rules of the game. And think about it. These are ways of doing this cheap and, and politically less controversial. So you can imagine why all these governments are excited about these nudge units. Because you can propose changes of behavior for people without having to go through the political contestation, let's say, in Congress or with the political forces in the in Congress or with the different stakeholders that the government has to deal with. Because it's basically, let's change, let's not change the system, the infrastructure of rules, norms, and the like, regulations, and let's just try to get people to do the right thing in a cheap way, because it's rapid, it's quick to implement. You don't need major legal reforms to try to do some of these things, including 
collecting more taxes or getting people to do more recycling or getting people to save more energy. Um, but in fact, when, when you read the paper by Charles Lowenstein, they, they upfront put it on the table that most of the major S-frame transformations that happen in society, um, they have been not because of I-frame changes, but because of changes in the, in the structure, in the, in the S-frame. Um, and, and therefore, uh, with this idea that the I-frame is showing this very small or null results, along with the need for major transformational changes in the structure, then one, one think about that. And I'm going to quote exactly some sentences that I think are very illustrative of this, uh, on why the attention to the I-frame may delay or distract us from thinking about S-frame changes. History seems to show that the, bio, the, bio, the, the solution to individual fri human frailty has been to change the system, not guide the individual. The gold standard of experimental testing provides a further push towards iframe interventions, where different individuals may randomly assign distinct interventions and away from S-frame interventions. So I'm, trying to, to, I'm going to try to tackle this challenge and see how we can move forward in that sense. And Chatter and Lois put some examples there that I think are very interesting. One of them is, is very interesting about climate change and carbon e emissions. So we know that social norms of emulating other people works, and people put more solar panels when they see more neighbors putting solar panels. Um, but then we need to do something about carbon pricing and building codes on, on different buildings. And what if putting attention on the former is going to uh, distract us from doing major changes that are needed in the latter? In terms of plastic waste, uh, waste uh, the idea of promoting voluntary recycling versus regulation on single-use plastics, on obesity, the difference between nutrition labels as opposed to sugar taxes, in healthcare, the idea of sending messages to remind people of using medications as opposed to having governments cap pricing certain drugs. These are examples of the distraction on iframe that are taking us away from thinking about the S-frame. In retirement, the idea of say more tomorrow, inducing certain changes to induce people to voluntarily contributing more to um, to save for their pensions as opposed to getting legal action to get employers to support and do co-payments so that the, the workers are going to be having a safer future in that sense. And in the environment, there is an, a, an interesting case um, because, again, and this is one of the points that later I will highlight, um, with this pandemic and with this idea of the energy transition and then comes the invasion on Ukraine and then we come with all this mess regarding the energy sector. One think if just by nudging people to save energy is going to be enough for the time we have not to reach the 1.5 degrees extra that we have sort of agreed with scientists that it's a, a cap that we should not try to surpass. Uh, so time is going to be important because eventually this might work in the sense that you get more and more people to switch their cars, to switch their panels, to change their practices and the like, and eventually this could catch on and, and create those changes. But what if it takes too much time? Um, I'm going to talk about slavery abolition in a second. It took 100 years to abolish slavery. From the first country that abolished slavery, Haiti, all the way to the last one, Brazil, about 100 years. Maybe we don't have 100 years to solve some of these environmental problems. And there's a paper which precisely Lowenstein worked on. It's very interesting and, and it was published in Nature, in, in Nature Climate Change, which is a, an experiment in which they show that when they offer people not just about saving energy, it dis, d reduces their likelihood to vote for a carbon tax. So think about that. Carbon tax is one of those examples, I was sharing this with my students this morning, carbon tax is one of those few, few examples in which you can get a lot of economists agreeing on. So it's like a policy solution that we all think it's more okay, more or less okay, maybe a second best, but it's going, it, it, it could work. But if by nudging people to save energy, we're taking away the possibility of people passing a carbon tax in Congress or in litigation or in the different arenas in which these negotiations are going to have, then one thinks, one, one wonders about this. Um, so this is, if you guys are looking for thesis topics, there are so many things that could be thought of. For example, this whole movement about ESGs, 
in companies in the private sector. They are so excited about ESG, but then they're also excited about the nudging and the behavioral actions that they can support, which in a way from the standpoint of the private sector is similar to this excitement by the public sector to set nudge units, is in the private sector to implement all these strategies so that they don't have to touch the structure. They don't have to touch the structural issues that are at place. And I don't have to justify in this building, in this department, in this university, uh, why it would be eventually important to think about more structural changes, let's say, from the standpoint of, of companies. Um, so with that, think about slavery that I was mentioning before. Th this is just a thought experiment, and it may sound cruel. But imagine that we were going to deal with this kind of uh, strategies trying to nudge slave owners to be kinder because they are pro-social, and then this could postpone the idea of abolishing slavery. And just trying to create another set of strategies to improve the relationships between slave owners and slaves. This is, this is the kind of question that, that would think if one thinks about, about the moment, the historic moment, of something that needed the type of major transformation and agreement throughout the world. And, so that finally, but again, over a 100 years period, ended up with all the countries in the world abolishing this, this particular practice. Um, and with the behavioral tab, I, I, I have to plead guilty too. I just finished a paper with a, with a number of colleagues because a, a, a major bank in Colombia, a private bank, asked me if we could put in practice this idea of behavioral sciences and the idea of uh, tackling an important problem that banks were going to have during the pandemic because people were going to hit, being hit severely because of the because of the of the pandemic and they were going to suffer but at the same time the 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 the, the credit default in many players in the system would would be risky in 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 general for the financial sector and, and I said to them, I would be willing to try what I know about trust and reciprocity and these kind of things uh, if they work. And, and eventually, they, they worked in an interesting way, by the way. So we, we use one of these ideas, one of these strategies to use behavioral messages to get the clients of the, this bank who were in default, they were already in delinquency in their credits, uh, mortgages, credit cards, and personal consumption. And we improved and recovered in average some four to 5% of those clients who were in default to get back to their payments on time. The interesting thing, which is going to come back later, is that the result was only positive for the messages that had to do with social norms and moral norms. Other messages about the contract or the cost efficiency of this or that the bank would be better able to provide more credit for others, other kinds of things were not as effective as the messages that have to do, this is the right thing to do because you will feel better with yourself and others and because other people are paying on time in their credits in the bank. Uh, so I, I plead guilty on being part of also of using this and see how this can be implemented. Um, but then again, the point to, to summarize so far is that, that we have been paying too much attention about this iframe in the bottom, and we are losing the connection with the S-frame. And too much focus on this iframe will reduce the possibility of these changes and in, in the structures that I have been mentioning. And furthermore, and I have mentioned a couple examples, the problem of uh, this uh, over attention to the iframe and, 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 and less attention to the structural changes may uh, crowd out that possibility of getting citizens to, to push for, for major changes. Uh, not only in the, in the case of these people who were invited to do a kind of a behavioral change in terms of energy and then decreasing their probability of supporting a carbon tax, one of my papers from my dissertation was precisely about the crowding out effect of introducing a material incentive in sanctioning materially people who were not cooperating in protecting a commons and ended up eroding the intrinsic motivation of those people to cooperate to implement a self-governed, self-enforced actions to protect those commons. So definitely these, these fears of crowding out from too much attention into the iframe are, are there. And so this, this continuing disconnect, I wanted to respond to that. And, and my proposal, in a way, is to think about the C-frame. 
Um, the C frame as a bridge between this I frame and this S frame. Um, and let me say a little bit of what I mean about that C frame idea. Uh, the C frame with the C is about communities, cooperation, collective action. Um, it is about thinking how these small groups build institutions, they shape institutions, institutions at the local level through social norms, through structures that they build to themselves through these self-governed ideas. And this happens in many ways in contemporary modern economies, in the workplace, in neighborhoods, but also in villages, in the rural areas everywhere. And this idea that the, the, the community is capable of designing institutions, uh, formal and informal, to make things happen that are aggregating a smaller number of people achieve changes. And, and that's the starting point of what I'm trying to say. And um, these communities, these groups constrain, they align individuals towards group-oriented goals. And these group-oriented goals is our ultimate work, what we are care, caring about. How do we get group-oriented goals adding up so that we end up in a situation that we would like to be? Um, also because they may aggregate as more and more groups aggregate this collective action, they may elevate the political cloud to create the transformations. And I'm going to give you three examples that I have been working on uh, more detail in thinking about this, this particular paper. Uh, so in a way, the idea is to bridge between this disconnect between the I frame and the S frame. And because I think it's in this C frame, in this intermediate level, that formal institutions encounter the individual action. Uh, this is, at the end, the actual changes or lack of changes of citizens towards what happens in the formal institutions is happening through the communities. The communities or the groups are the ones that make formal institutions be accepted or rejected. They make them transform the individual action because they legalize in a way they make more legitimate within the group the acceptance of certain formal institutions, but they can also block through civil resistance that formal institutions make or play a role in that sense. And so that's where this, this, this disconnect could be then connected back. And when these informal institutions emerge or su are sustained or die at this local level within those groups, and in aggregation creating the political cloud to push changes from the bottom up might be some, some clue into, into the future. Um, and in that way, we can think less naively about how sometimes the S-frame transformations uh, are not working. Uh, in many cases, one wonders why these are not working. Why? very well-intentioned legal mechanisms end up deviating to, towards other goals and through many dynamics that can have from rent-seeking to political control to corruption deviating from the original uh, objectives that's uh, going to be problematic. Um, this was supposed to be read or I don't know about sound. Um, Everyone's able to hear one. Yeah. Yeah, that is the recording. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about the yeah, recording. The sound is okay? It's okay. Okay, great. So before this, I, I ra wrap up the idea of the C-frame and give you these three examples. There's something that has been intriguing me. And I, uh, I'm thinking about the family also as an institution. How does the family play a role here? And how does it play a role in this particular discussion, and of course, one has to talk about Nancy. And Nancy kindly sent me an email saying she couldn't be here because this was going to be about her work too. But precisely sitting with her recently, having lunch and talking a little bit of these ideas, of course we have to think about Nancy Volbrey in, in, in these issues. How, how does the family fit in here? And it fits in several ways. Um, this is a nice quote by, by Heckman and, and Mosso that says, childhood is the province of the family. Any investigation of how conditions in childhood affect life outcomes is a study of family influence. Um, Heckman has been pursuing this study of the family context to think about child development, one of his major areas of contribution. And, and one of the intriguing, interesting things that he has been finding is that even in Denmark, where they have the most precious panel data set of people from birthplace to the grave, complete, of Danish people from all these long periods of time, is that even there, with such society that has been strengthened by the action of the government and being redistributed and progressive, 
The family still plays a major role in explaining a great deal of the social mobility of Danes. And it's really fascinating when he's arguing why this is not only about the state creating the opportunities, but also the family creating that. So I, I hope you see what I'm trying to do here. It's again the family building something around the individual that is not exactly the S frame, but is creating around the individual something that is empowering, is enabling, and we need to, to, to think about that. There's another interesting thing, uh, piece of, of data that, that I found interesting by John List in his latest book, uh, uh, the, the Voltage Effect, in which they have been doing a follow-up of children who entered this, uh, this particular project, this intervention that they have been doing in the Chicago Heights project, one of the poorest neighborhoods in Chicago, and they have been putting all these children, but they are, putting, they are doing also a, a parents' school along with the, with the early childhood program for these children. And one of the interesting things that they find is that the very few positive effects that they have been finding in investing in these children are in Hispanics. And why? Because of the multi-level family structure. With Hispanics, they always find an aunt, a cousin, a grandmother, a grandfather. I can name you right now from memory the names of my 34 cousins only from my father's side. <laughs> right now. I can tell you all 34 of them. And they are strong, quick family, strong and, and close family in that sense. So this is an interesting piece of that evidence too. How is the family fitting in all this? So I. I keep wondering how much is the family part of not or of this C frame. Uh, so there's going to be something there that is uh, jumping in my in my mind, and and I need to have two or three or more lunches with Nancy precisely to talk about this uh, because it's the community and the family in that sense. So back to the community to to the, to the C frame. Let me give you three examples that I think are going to be interesting. One of them, and these are examples that are just beginning to dig into the, into the history and the, and the literature to understand what is happening there. One of them is the women's war in Nigeria during the uh, late 1920s. The other one is the decline of food binding in China. And the third one is back from home, which is uh, res uh, resonating in some things that have to do precisely with my uh, graduate work here uh, at UMass. And so quickly, the first two, the, the women's war or the Awa women's protest in Nigeria is a very interesting case because it was a movement that ended up toppling these chiefs that the British colonial system was imposing on communities that were called the Warren Chiefs. And these were people, locals, that were appointed by the British colonial rule to control things. They were supposed to be the, the, the delegates of the imperial uh, colonial system to rule this part of Africa. But it so happens that in those cases, things were working in a different way. So these women began to organize against that. And because they were resisting the, patriarch the, the patriarchal system of putting only men, because only men were war chiefs, only men to have this role of representing the British colonial in an indirect rule type of governing, and to control taxing, to control the, the economy, and even to control family uh, issues. And women began to, to, to resist that, this idea of these uh, men because at the time there was more equality of access to power, but by men and women in, in many affairs of the of the people in, in in of the families in Nigeria, and they applied certain techniques that were interesting. One of them was what was called sitting on a man, and sitting on a man was surrounding a group of women, surrounding a man, and begin to shame the the man, or surrounding his heart and begin to shun or, or, or shame this person in public because of the things that they were trying to complain because of the behavior of this guy. So they began to apply this tradition that was have, has always been happening there towards these warren chiefs. So it included chants, it included dancing, it included music, including all kinds of things, but also even destroying precious properties of, of, of things that they valued, these people. And even the wives of these warren chiefs ended up joining the sitting on demand practice. Uh, probably the pressure and, and also sharing the same concerns that this institution was creating this. At the end, major changes were made, and finally the British colonial system ended up taking away these warrant chiefs away. And some people, some historians claim that this was an early start on major changes on uh, taking down the, the British colonial system in, at the time. Uh, so, begin to think what kind of practices are happening there and why that is interesting. The other case on the, on the foot binding, you all know, uh, this lasted for about a, th a thousand years. I mean, thousand years with this practice. And then um, 
things began to change, and within one generation, one generation, food binding disappeared. And, and, and Mackie has been studying this, and this paper by Mackie and Lejeune, they identified three mechanisms that I found that are going to be very interesting for that. One is that the reformers began to educate the public, saying, hey, nobody else is doing this around the world. We are the only ones. Second mechanism, hey, there are good things about having natural feed advantages, and there are also disadvantages of maintaining this food binding in terms of the health of the girls. And third, they created these natural feed societies, small clubs, societies, in which they committed within the natural feed society, if you had a male child, you commit so that your child will marry a girl that didn't have her feet bound. And if you had a girl, you will commit to marry a boy who accepted that, and you commit then not to, to bound the feet of your, of, your, of your daughter. And over a generation, this whole thing, this practice disappeared. But these natural feed societies were these small groups that were creating this, and these just began to replicate and replicate and replicate all over. And the third case is, is a little bit uh, more detailed. And this resulted with what I call sometimes the most successful land reform that has ever happened in Colombia, and probably in Latin America. About 6 million hectares, which is more than 14 million of acres, were titled to black communities in Colombia over a short period of time. I mean, this government, the current government, the Petro government in Colombia, committed to have 3 million hectares redistributed in an agrarian reform, and now they are acknowledging that they won't have the money, and now they went down from 3 million to 1.5 million. And then the Minister of Agriculture just said last week, we might reach half a million hectares in the first couple of years. Six million hectares were titled to black communities in Colombia in one of the poorest areas in the country. There was a guy writing a dissertation here back in the late 90s, and this is the first page of that dissertation that Sam was one of the committee members and a major advisor and helped with all that. And I wrote there on February 11, 1998, just recently at the time, the Colombian government entitled the Consejo Comunitario Mayor del Medio Atrato, a group of 110 rural communities of about 45,000 people with almost 700,000 hectare, hectares, about 1.7 million acres of land in the Pacific coast of, of Colombia. Imagine one single title of 1.7 million acres for 47, 45,000 people, a families, a 45,000 people to govern collectively this piece of land. And there was no better motivation for me for my dissertation from for doing field work than thinking the start of this. So precisely combining different methods, going into the field and doing experiments in the field, and I'm not going to go over those experiments now, but doing these experiments to try to understand the dynamics at the micro level of these groups. I have been working in that particular region because those four states, if you want to call them departamentos, are the region where most of the black population in Colombia has moved to and, and is living today, and in those places was where this land tagging was happening and asking ourselves and with other colleagues two questions. What happened in terms of socioeconomic outcomes and what happened in terms of forest conservation? Major questions that I had back when I started my dissertation. So I have been working on those issues in, and studying this. I did experiments in the field. These are pictures from those first experiments that I was doing in the field. But also doing those experiments included doing workshops with the community members and listening to them and having them to tell me stories about what is happening in reality. Uh, that is me without gray hair many years ago. <laughs> but I'm not going to blame the gray hair to either the dissertation or my school work or my students. Um, so in this area, we were able to collect an immense data set from satellite imagery all the way to the registry of each of these titles, and then a census made by the government on the poorest communities because they needed to focalize people so that they could do social programs in this region that is full of, um, uh, oh, it's, it's, it has one of the highest levels of poverty around the country. But also the fact that the transition was gradual, so the bluer the image, that's the earliest of the resolutions that 
titled the land to these communities to the rare, which is the latest of those, okay? So there was a period of time within 1996 all the way to 2011 that we could track all these households and all these collective titles and tr try to uh, understand what was happening because of that. But there's a little bit of history that is important here. And that history is that the reason this happened as an outcome was the result of what I would call a C-frame type of interaction from the bottom up. And that was a major movement of communities, mostly black communities, organized by themselves, sometimes with support with the church, the Catholic church in some of these places in the region, that began to create local associations to resist the arrival of mining companies and the arrival of timber companies. Because this region at the time and before this titling were public lands. And these public lands were more or less open for grabs for anyone who wanted to come. And the wealth in terms of natural capital that was available there was incredibly immense. The wealth in terms of the possibility of mining and extracting timber, of very valuable timber woods, by the way, in that area. So we ended up studying this throughout this period of time. And that movement that started in the 1980s to the 1990s found the perfect storm. And the perfect storm was the Constitutional Assembly in 1991 in Colombia. So there was a major Constitutional Assembly that was going to reform a constitution that was 100 years old. And in that Constitutional Assembly, notice how interesting this is, black communities could not elect representatives. Not that they were not allowed, they didn't add up the votes necessary. So they, they postulated people for, for being, they nominated people for being elected and they didn't make it. They didn't make, make enough votes. But the indigenous communities did get seats in the Constitutional Assembly. And the indigenous communities, leaders, ended up representing the black communities, and they imposed in the Constitutional Assembly one particular article that was a transitory article in the Constitution in 1991 that said in the Constitution, the government will have two years to recognize the occupation of black communities all throughout that territory. Not only recognize, but title and formalize collectively the ownership of that land. Within two years, the government has, as, as a time frame, to start issuing a law and implement this. So it's not only issuing the law, it's implementing that. So they ended up implementing that over those years. So in 1996, I am starting my PhD here at UMass. I'm starting to take Econ 700 and all these courses, and this is beginning to happen. And it happened throughout all the years. This is the cumulative number of hectares that were titled and the number of community councils that ended up being titled. So we have, in a way, not a perfect natural experiment, but we have, at some point, pre-treated town or, or villages to in-treatment and post-treatment villages. So we could do some econometrics of that. And we ended up doing, and I'm not going to, to bother you with the, with the details, but let me give you the summary of the findings. What we found is that the per capita income increased in these communities. This is against the counterfactual, being the same community before titling or neighboring communities that are similar and did not get collective title of the, of the land. So per capita income increased. Poverty was lower with the index, indices of poverty that they read. Wealth was increased in terms of the value of the ownership that they had. Remember, this is collective property. This is not private property. School attendance improved and home improvements increased. You don't have a deed for your house in these territories. You cannot sell your house. You cannot sell the land. The land is inalienable and it cannot be fractioned. It's collective ownership and they cannot use this land, not even as collateral for credit. So you don't own that piece of land personally. And yet people were investing in their houses. So this is another alternative to the Soto kind of argument assign clear property rights. They don't have to be private. They can be collective, and people will invest in their well-being. And then overcrowding decreased compared to the counterfactual. So these are some of the effects. We, we did this in one of the papers. And in another paper, we also demonstrated that deforestation was lower in these places than in neighboring or, co or comparable villages. So what happened there? I think that the C-frame in action is these communities organizing from the 1980s, putting pressure, and then somehow the perfect storm brought all these things 
to get the Constitutional Assembly to pass something, and then to get the government finally to push for these changes, and then eventually implementing what I think is one of the most successful land reforms that have happened in, in Colombia, and maybe in Latin America in so many ways. Um, so you ended up with an S-frame type of policy. So I think there's a place for the I-frame here, and the place for the I-frame is that there's something happening at these communities at the very micro level. I was doing to the field in the Pacific Coast, doing experiments there, not only for my dissertation, but later. And I repeated many experiments to understand what was happening in these dynamics at the group level that make cooperation happen, collective action happen, maintain trust, maintain reciprocity, and this type of mechanism. So if I think of putting together these three examples in a quick way, the, the, the problem of the collective tithing that I was mentioning, or the women's war in Nigeria, or the elimination of food buying, there are certain I-frame type of mechanisms that we have been studying all along in this behavioral revolution that have to do with identity, that have to do with trust, with reciprocity, with prosociality. Most of the contributions that have to do with understanding how individuals become prosocial are the result of research of the type of work that Sam has done. And a cooperative species is a landmark paper in that sense, but also a moral economy in that way for, for that matter too. And, and these two books are exactly are, are explaining a lot of what is happening in terms of the I-frame, but how it is a permanent dialogue with the C-frame. Because it is within groups that these things happen. It's not in isolation. It's not that it's the citizen in isolation. It's a citizen in community a citizen in place, a citizen with something surrounding, maybe the family too. This is, the, again, that Aster is part of this story. And then at the end, you see S-frame changes happen. So this is, this is, for me, sort of the challenge to look for how we can rethink again about this I-frame idea. And instead of thinking that anything that is I-frame is because it is nudging, and therefore we should sort of take it away from the picture. It's more like, how is this going to happen? And for me, it's the C-frame, the, 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 the vehicle to try to do that. Uh, there are other cases that I'm beginning to think, and, and they might be the case of the cocaleros in, in Bolivia with the mass movement that took all the way to get Evo Morales in power, and major social transformations that happened in Bolivia that started with the cocaleros as, as, as a major bottom-up grassroots movement that ended up going all the way up to, to these S-frame changes. Uh, the case of the suffragettes, I think, may have some interesting stories there that one I, I, I am going to start uh, digging on, on how they reach all the way to getting women's rights happen. Uh, the slavery abolition uh, movement may have some insights there because there might be some cases in which this began as local dialogues among certain communities that begin to add up and these local movements uh, pushing from the bottom up. Uh, the Forest Rights Act in India, I think, is another interesting example that I should dig into. But women organizing for the rights to tribal land to get more uh, empowerment or more uh, recognition by the formal system to manage their land and to manage their forest. So if you have more ideas of these kind of examples, where at the local community level, something begins to happen and in aggregation begins changing the S-frame, that's the kind of levels that I'm uh, trying to think. So I think this, there, there's theory that we can work on this um, in terms of using, if we can use the Schelling's type of language of thinking that the collective action problem is difficult because the incentives, because of the temptation, will get us to the, to the Nash equilibrium where everybody's going to end up uh, not cooperating, but we would all like to be cooperating, but then it depends on the level of the number of cooperators. To me, the, 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 the more interesting question in taking this one step further is in thinking on the non-linearities of these cases, and you probably have seen all these these particular diagrams, again, using the Schelling uh, model, that maybe by transforming the payoffs, or at least the subjective payoffs that people perceive in these games, maybe you can end up with some kinds of other type of dynamics that can take you to interior equilibrium or to the corners or to the extremes. And when thinking about that, I began to remember this, this particular framework that I was using that emerged from my dissertation, but then I enriched with the conversation with Elanino Rostrom. And Sam is guilty of that too, because some, I, I think I have told this story before, when Lynn Ostrom was invited to Thompson to give one of the seminars, Sam knew about all this work that I was doing. I had just finished my field work. And Sam said, you are going to take Lynn Ostrom for lunch, and nobody else is coming. And we're not going to tell anyone. No, you know if you remember that. And you said, you are going to take her on your own. And I was 
terrified. I mean, this, this person is the person that I was citing the most in my dissertation. And I began to tell her about my work, and then we ended up coming up, and, and, and the, origin, the, the, the preliminary idea of this framework was in my dissertation, and then working with her, we ended up publishing a paper precisely about that. And, and the idea is the following. Yes, there are some basic payoffs that we need to look at in the basic game, but there are other layers that are playing a role that have to do with the C frame and the S frame. From the formal to the informal institutions, social norms, identity, reciprocity mechanisms, all these things that have been well studied and at the time were not as clear, but thanks to Sam again, this became more and more structured in a theoretical way to understand how people end up doing things that they shouldn't if they were homo economicus, all those mechanisms having to do with these different layers. And the whole argument of the framework is, as you put all those layers, you begin to transform the game, and eventually you can transform a cooperation game into a coordination game, and eventually into games where you have multiple equilibria or even one equilibria that is related to the, to the, to the desire. And let me give you one piece of, 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 of hope in that sense. This is a study that we did with the Center for the Sustainable Development Goals for Latin America in Colombia. And this is a survey in 13 cities in, six, in seven Latin American countries. And it's a major survey representative of, the, of 13 uh, uh, cities. And in this survey, we ask all kinds of things, including pro-sociality, how much people approved policies that redistribute towards the poor, that the state uh, devote taxes towards helping the poor, um, redistribution in general, uh, helping uh, the, the most vulnerable, these kind of questions. And then on the other hand, we ask all kinds of questions about uh, environmental, uh, pro-environment behavior, whether people were recycling, whether people were saving energy, whether people were uh, paying more for organic products, this kind of behaviors, and also favorability of policies of that kind. And it is really interesting that regardless of the city or the country, there is a very strong correlation between the, what we could build as an index of pro-sociality in these citizens with an index of pro-environment pro attitudes and pro-environment behaviors. And they are strongly correlated. So there is something telling us that when people care about the others, they care about the environment and vice versa, and therefore Maybe there's a way to think again about this local surrounding of the individual. How is it about protecting the immediate environment and protecting the immediate group of people that they share those spaces with on how these dynamics can happen? But again, the problem is that we need to get out of this low equilibria to those high equilibria. And those high equilibria, we want to get there. And the question is if not just with this little push here is going to maintain us here. How much the push has to be to get all the way there? Again, let's say energy transition is going to come from citizens switching their cars, their roofs, their light bulbs, and these kind of things. But maybe that is going to take a long time. And maybe we don't have 100 years to make that transformation if we hit some critical thresholds in terms of the climate, right? So time is a constraint in that sense. Um, so that's to, to, to think about how is this going to happen in a way that you get not individuals, but groups, that's the C frame, climbing this up because of the group that maybe individual action is not going to, to happen. But then groups being able to climb all, all, all the way there and transform that. And in a way, this has to do with a, a, another framework that, that Sam has been working on with Wendy Carlin precisely on this idea of going beyond this dichotomy with the, between the market and, and, and the government. If one think that the market type of solutions are more close to the I frame, the government type of solution of the S frame, and then he's adding this third, which is civil society, so C again, the C frame, and then the idea that at this civil society there are certain transformations that can go into trying to affect the way governments are going to uh, change things, if we need governments to change things in this type of transformational situation. So looking back at the, at the behavioral revolution, I think we as experimentalists and behavioralists, uh, we found a niche. And, and I think Sam in his words made it very clear. Uh, maybe some of them were low-hanging fruits. Maybe some of those things were happening. But, but this niche, this comfort zone, had some certain interesting features. Uh, we found a way of having large samples um, at even low cost, be, depending on how you design your experiment. Uh, you could use cheaper incentives in the way that you can pay very little to 
college students and even people in the streets and you go to other countries where the power of exchange rate can take you a long way with paying low amounts of, of money to people, you can create low stakes in this or low cost uh, stakes in, in this kind of uh, experiments and yet maintaining certain salience and external validity. Um, you have found, we have found ways of connecting this to the external validity, which has been always a criticism to that. We extended from the weird population to the non-weird population. If you remember Joe Hendricks' idea of the Western educated, industrialized, um, uh, uh, democratic societies. Um, we have collaborated with the RCT community, the random control trials community in that sense. All this has found a, a, an interesting niche. Uh, but I think we have studied more how the S frame affects behavior. Uh, but we have studied less the opposite direction, how the I-frame affects the S-frame situation. And I think that's, that's a major challenge. Um, I think many things have been absent in this comfort zone that we have been in this behavioral revolution. Um, we are not studying how these structures, these S-frame structures change um, because of I-frame changes. We just take for granted that that's the structured system and then we study how the I frame, how the individual changes behavior. Um, and we take mostly the S frame as given. Um, we have studied less the group dynamics. Because in a way, the comfort zone takes us to do experiments with individuals. But doing experiments with groups is way costly. It's very costly in the sense of having one observation, one community, instead of one observation, one household, or one observation, one individual. Um, but I think we have a long way to go there. One more. This is something that with Kevin we have been discussing and, and, and we are going to try to, to see how we tackle this. The powerful have been absent in all these experiments. The powerful are difficult to get to the lab, but the powerful are defining many of these structures uh, and the representatives of the powerful. I mean, it would be also difficult to put the representatives of the powerful and the powerful within <laughs> the context of a controlled experiment in, in the lab or in the field. Uh, but we need to introduce that to see how that affects the S frames and how that affects also how the C frames interact. Uh, so I think looking ahead, we need to get out of this comfort zone. Uh, I think we have learned a lot about voters, consumers, uh, and how these individuals respond to these incentives of many kinds, financial, moral, uh, uh, social, and the like. Uh, but we have learned less about how firms and managers hire and promote and fire workers, although there is some work there. Uh, how firms affect public policies. They lobby to get policies changed. I think that the, the, the behavioral community needs to contribute more on that. Uh, for example, greenwashing. Greenwashing is an interesting area of research in this sense. Uh, is greenwashing uh, stopping the changes that need to be happening? Uh, happening or is just a distraction not to get too much attention from the key stakeholders in, in the companies or how the politicians manipulate or guide or lobby to get certain things done or bribe or cheat. Um, so I think it is hard to get the powerful in, in our labs. I think we need to do more on the behavioral side of understanding the powerful. Um, it's going to be very expensive, but we need to, I think we need to do it. And it is much harder to think about the S frame as endogenous within the lab um, and think about the S frame as an output variable and not just as an explanatory variable. Um, where do we find clues? Ernst Fair and John Lees did an experiment many, many years ago with coffee grower CEOs in a congress of coffee growers. That was interesting to watch, and I haven't seen anything of that kind. And, and it was an interesting paper to read, and they did experiments with them trying to understand uh, their relationship between workers and managers. Um, of course, Oriana Bandeira and, and Imran Rasul have been doing very interesting stuff in doing experiments with managers and workers in, in the fields and, and see how the incentives change uh, the behavior, um, mostly about the behavior of the workers. We need to, um, and, and a little bit of all the supervisors and the managers. Um, but we need to do, again, more experiments on groups and group dynamics, which is, again, about the C frame. Um, there are some papers, interesting papers, about political elites uh, doing some experiments and survey work looking at the, at the behavioral um, traits of these people. I think these are important. And of course, Eliana La Ferrara and, and, and Alberto Alessina and those groups who have been doing studies non-experimental about communities, neighborhoods, and the like are again about this C-frame. Um, so the, the more general question is if we can understand more this disconnect between the I-frame and the S-frame or my 
puzzling question of how, if we have humans that can do things and, and they aggregate, they are happening, what is the role that this C-frame is playing there? And in a way, the F-frame, the, the family, which I think is important in that sense. Um, so if the nudges are not going to change, these systemic changes, what then? Um, I think the I-frame should remain there. Uh, we need to continue thinking about preferences, rationality, uh, agency of, of humans. The S-frame should be part also of uh, understanding the behavioral factors that drive the, 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 the S-frame, but thinking more about power, bargaining, uh, social preferences on the like of the powerful. Um, I think the I-frame have uh, the, the iframe experiments have helped us uh, understand how certain factors find resistance for changes, but we need to understand more how those changes could happen. And again, that's why these three examples that I gave you, I think, are about that. And in responding to, to, to Chatter and Lowenstein about this iframe versus S frame with the C frame, is how it sits in between about collective action, about social norms, about guidelines, heuristics network social ties that when aggregating in groups and aggregating from the bottom up way uh, could end up at the end uh, shaping structural changes that we want. Uh, we need to continue creating this type of behavioral and experiments uh, to understand that, but also to put the S frame variables as an outcome variable in the experiments. Uh, there are very few experiments that would try to do that, to change the S frame type of uh, rules or institutions or outcomes. Uh, ultimately, it's putting more political economy into the behavioral sciences, and especially when policies that are making changes uh, from these behavioral insights. I think that's the challenge ahead, and I think we have a long way to go, and I think the behavioral revolution needs to continue, continue contributing to this, but we need to get out of their comfort zone and challenge ourselves with these new questions. So that's it. Thank you very much. So uh, thanks a lot, Juan Camilo. Uh, we have about 20 minutes where we'll open it up uh, for, for comments and so on. After, after this, we do have a reception uh, downstairs in the atrium of, 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 of Gordon Hall. To which you're all invited. But let me open it up for questions, comments, observations. Everybody wants treats. Uh, and I'm the only one coming. <laughs> There's one. Yes? Yeah. Uh, maybe a basic question. So I think I listened to that song, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, like two weeks ago. And I listened to it every two by weeks. By coincidence? Oh, uh, no, by. Uh, uh, religious de devotion. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and like most of that song, I think it's kind of what you're saying. Like most of that song, he's telling us what the revolution is not. But there's like one line where he says what the revolution is. And he says the revolution will put you in the driver's seat. And I was kind of thinking about that throughout this because it seems like a lot of your critique is that the economic uh, theory has focused on individual decisions without looking at like social decisions or social choices or social processes. So I'm kind of wondering, first off, what do you mean by the revolution? And like second off, like if it's not through nudges, how do we get to this point uh, where we democratically, collectively make decisions as a society and have the glorious communist utopia? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, th thank you for that comment. I, I even thought about playing a little bit of the song, of one of the songs. Or, or showing the lyrics, but then it would take even more time. Um, but it it's, it's indeed has to do with, with putting people in the driver's seat. Uh, but I think it's putting communities in the driver's seat. I mean, to me, it's thinking about how communities can get in the driver's seat, civil society in the driver's seat, to drive literally and figuratively these changes, as in some of these cases that I'm thinking that are illustrative of that kind of dynamic. It was these small groups these natural fit societies, these women's group in during the sitting on the men, these particular associations of consejos comunitarios in Colombia who started from the community level and began to say, hey, we can get together and get some help with this priest who is going to help us write down these bylaws to create this association, and then we can get legal recognition, and then we can apply for a collective title of land upon the government, but also that pressure that in the Constitutional Assembly, they ended up saying, this has to happen because it's acknowledging the presence of these groups that are organized. So this is not about 
I give out. This is not about, let's do give this to people. No, let's acknowledge what they have been doing. So this is about putting the communities in the driver's seat. So I thank you, thank you for that, uh, for that question. And, and again, uh, yes, the album is is interesting, and, and I am not a, a hip hop kind of uh, expert or, or fan. But but the, the 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 sentence rang in my head, and then I began listening to the album, and then I almost thought about putting some quote here about that or or the or the songs. Yeah, but yeah, thank you. Yes. Kind of following up on that question, I think your. Uh, framework where you have S frame and C frame and I frame really fits very well in, in studying revolutions, like real big revolutions. Like, let's think about the Chinese revolution. Well, the Chinese Communist Party had a uh, agenda to change the S frame. And then they started with, by building C frame, of course, local level party organization. And, and that led to the big change. And then, there was the cultural revolution which tried to change the high frame. Yeah. So I, I find this framework particularly relevant to understanding this thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. No, no, I, I, agree. I, I agree in that sense. And again, remember <laughs> that the Chinese revolution had huge influence in Latin America. Also the Cuban revolution, huge influence in Latin America. And, and the results have been very troublesome, I'm, at least for, from the Colombian side. And, and I am a person who grew up as an adult during the 80s to realize and suffer much of the tensions of this failed attempt. But hopefully, because the peace process is also a reflect that something survived out of that revolutionary type of movement, survived to let things at least there latent so that a negotiation happened between the government and the Marxist guerrillas uh, from the FARC mostly. Um, but it, it's not complete, that process, but hopefully something will happen out of that. But it is interesting that the, the things that are being discussed today, in many ways we sound back to that. Uh, the idea of going back in the agrarian reform that they are proposing to local collectives at the local level, cooperatives and small groups of communities to have back access to the land and to local public goods and see how things will go, but obviously with a lower st a stigma on the market institutions to allow this to allow this community to flourish. Um, but but yeah, I, I mean it could be compatible in that sense to that kind of, of historical process. Um, um, yeah, I, at least the origin of how it transformed things all the way up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, well, yes. Okay, uh, great, uh, great presentation, thank you. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the um, uh, the literature, the debate where you started about the, the proposition that uh, behavioral economics has demonstrated the capacity of nudges, per se, to have a major impact, and that apparently the I don't know about other papers, but the one you cited has demonstrated the opposite. The nudges in and of themselves have been very, very little. And you, know, you said that uh, yeah, the, the literature that had been making this point that nudges were the you know, nudging behavior was having this major impact was, was kind of the consensus position within the literature. And, uh, was it, is it simply just this one new paper that you just cited that has now overturned these results, or is this something that has been generally acknowledged? And that uh, to what extent are we saying that, uh, yeah, this is group behavior and self-reinforcement that was, was uh, maintaining this position? Comparable, I think, you know, in what I teach, one of the things I teach in macro is the extent to which this notion of uh, labor market rigidities is the cause of unemployment, and you have 30 years of literature purporting to demonstrate that this is true, and then over the, all, then all of a sudden, my friend who was here last week, David Howell, writes a paper and says, the, the whole thing is wrong. And actually, uh, Heckman uh, uh, acknowledged that, that uh, Howell and his co-authors had demonstrated that it was wrong. So where, where are we in terms of the literature on that? And to what extent have you seen changes in the literature? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 
I, I think that, that, that's that's a fair question because yeah, there there is a a growing um, number of studies now that so many people are doing these notch studies all over the place. So when you aggregate those, uh, you begin to see that not, not many of them work, and the ones that work are the ones that get press and visibility. But when aggregating many of these, this, the, the effects are small or, or even no. Um, and when they're academic papers, they have slightly higher effects. And, and to me, the, the, the more concerning part is that even if they have positive effects, the effects are small, and in aggregate, they are not going to take us to solve the climate change problem, if, if we want to put it that way. Uh, to me, that's, that's my concern. Uh, or taking a major change in the inequality in terms of income distribution or, or land distribution. That still is very worrisome in many parts of the world. Uh, or in changing the opportunities and the access of women to certain uh, factors of production or the access to education or the access to political spaces. And so then my concern is that even if those nudges may be working, they're not going to make major changes in the, in the more, in the bigger, bigger structural challenges that we have. Um, but, but again, at the beginning, every time one of these new extra study trying to do one of these nudges found a positive result, it was exciting. And, and, and we were all excited to see, wow, you can change people's behavior by changing the framing or changing the context or changing the menu of alternatives or changing information. But remember, all that was without touching the structure. So let's leave the, the structure untouched. And this is why this was so attractive to policymakers around the world, because it's cheaper, politically and economically. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's not making a dent on, on major challenges. Maybe it might change some things. I, I don't know exactly which ones of the structural bigger questions. But the ones that I'm worried about, again, environmental changes that we need to make to stop biodiversity loss, to stop deforestation, to stop climate change the way it's happening. I, I, I am worried about the possibility of these mechanisms to be working if we don't have a, a, a structural changes at a very high level. And again, this is why I worry about the powerful in the game and how we study behaviorally the powerful. Because the powerful are making most of the calls in many of these decisions. So there was a question here and then there. And then I will go on. Yes? Uh, so my question is kind of a traditional multi-part question. Um, so when you mentioned ESG, um, that made me really think about um, the corporate social responsibility um, and diversity, equity, inclusion policies um, alongside ESG. Um, and so my question is, um, do you think that those programs have the potential to shape um, fair and equitable outcomes in the S-frame? And if so, um, how do you think we can encourage firms to engage in those programs for normative reasons, um, as opposed to instrumental ones, like the effects of profitability? I mean, the, I think that the, the jury is still out in terms of ESG as a really transformational dynamic, all the way to simply greenwashing to, to get away with it. Uh, so it's going to be case by case. But changing the S frame in those domains in the private sector is going all the way to how profits are distributed between workers and the company. That would be S frame type of changes. Uh, sitting in the table in the boards by unions, that is the type of changes that I'm thinking. If those are the types of changes in the S-frame at the, at the corporate level, the S-frame of the private sector, then ESG, if ESG type of strategies include getting and trying to get all the way to this type of changes, then it, it, would, it might happen, but it might not. But I mean, the, the, the labor, the, 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 the union movement around the world has made major contributions to changing the S-frame uh, by achieving major changes. And, Today, they're still, in some cases, struggling. But at the same time, union rates are going down in many places in the world. In Colombia, the union rate is just really, really low. Why? Because during the 80s, they killed all the union leaders, people. They formed a political party, La Unión Patriotica, and they killed all of them. 800 of the directives of the Union Patriotica were assassinated in the, during the 90s, 80s and 90s. And so, uh, again, if ESG, 
type of strategies add up to these major transformations, the examples that I just gave, I, I think we should be welcoming and studying how this happens within the companies. How these dynamics within the companies are going to grow up from the bottom up to push for these major changes so that let's say unions have a seat in the board or sharing of the profits changes in the, in the corporate level. That kind of changes would be interesting to watch. Yes? Um, um, when my, my question is about the, this idea of powerful and power. Like when you're talking about the powerful or the representative and uh, that they're willing or that they have, and they have the opportunity to sit on the table and, and bargain and negotiate. What is, is there some kind of, of, is there a definition of power? How would you, how would you explore this? Like, because if we're talking about multi-level, I would say that one thing is the place power at the individual level, another one would be power at the community level, and how that power at the community level would, like, what, what would be the definition for it to interact with the structure? I mean, in, in core, in, in core the economy, the textbook, there's a very, explicit definition of power in how individuals get others to do things uh, in your favor and opposite to their intentions. If you have that capacity to get other people to do something in your favor and against their own benefit, that's because you have power. Uh, so I, I would use that, that definition. I think that the definition in core is very uh, clear in that sense. At any level, between a manager and a worker, all the way to a CEO and the union. So if you have the capacity to get the other party to do something that is in your benefit, but against the, the purposes of the other, then you have power over that, over that. I would use that definition. And therefore, powerful is the one who has who holds power in any of these social interactions. But I would, I would go with that. Which is interesting because you don't find any other principles of economics textbook that defines power. As far as I remember, the ones that are out there teaching students about economics in, in principles courses, you don't see one that, that has power like defined and let alone important. And yet in most of the things that happen in those textbooks about the markets, the labor market, uh, monopoly, monopsony, uh, all the things that we teach there are about power. Many of them are about power. The only thing we say is that market power and we don't want market power so it's ideal that there is no market power so that everybody's oppressed. oppressed. So this is why core is trying to change that narrative. And yes, I don't know, I, I'm missing the, the, the sequence. So yeah, Larry. Uh, yeah, no, this is a terrific talk. Thank you very much. It's really interesting. You know, it, I've been observing behavioral economics for a long time. You relax the individual utility maximization. We relax the individual's unit of analysis. We relax kind of a pluralist theory of power. Uh, we talk about the importance of socialization. What we have is back to the 1970s is sociology. I mean, there's been a lot of work on this stuff. The political process model of Doug McAdam, Page Agrarian Revolution, Marxian and Weberian sociology. I mean, I don't hear a lot of interaction, but I know there's a lot of really good work not so much an analysis, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> have you like, explicitly engaged in it? I want to hear what some things about that and, and, and sociology because you, you know a lot of this. And, and I don't know, I, I, I mean, I agree. I agree in general and I think it's like going back to in many ways. But what do you think of that assertion? In a way, it's just the sociology of the sentence. There are things that I think are new. There are extra contributions, but I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think that um, I think economics and the combination of using game theory to design experiments uh, and then to use incentives in the experiments really gave us insights, at least convincing results, which were not available from ethnographic uh, studies and were not available primarily from uh, sociological and even psychological experiments. Though the latter were better uh, designed. They, they weren't incentivized. So I think, I mean, it, it's often said, and it wouldn't be untrue, to say that behavioral economics affirmed, or some people would say unkindly discovered, things that everybody else already knew. Uh, but they didn't already know it. If you really think that we had good demonstrations in the 70s, 
that people were altruistic and reciprocal in the nature of those preferences and so on, then you must, you're much more gullible than I am in reading the literature. Uh, uh, so I've, I've tried to rely very heavily on the ethnographic literature to study, for example, endogenous preferences. I thought it was going to be easy when I started in some 1990 or something to find really well-established cases in which you could study the endogenous nature of, of preferences. It turns out to be very hard to find convincing cases of that. Uh, that's why I think we really have made some advances. But it's also true that I think some of the best studies uh, have been done in the area of, of political science, for example. There really are good ethnographic studies of, for example, why do people join these communities at uh, the, uh, the, the sea level? Uh, I'll refer to the work of Elizabeth Wood, who did fantastic ethnographic studies of why people join the FM. FMLN in, in El Salvador, studying how people essentially escaped the I-frame and got into the C-frame, and therefore became a really powerful uh, supporter of the uh, revolutionary movement there. Uh, truth in advertising is that that person is also my wife. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I add something on the sociology part? Because I, I think it's, this, this, can go, this is a very important conversation of what is happening in economics. Sociology gave us also networks analysis. I mean, and you're sitting next to a guy who knows a lot about that. And, and the analysis of networks, to me, is one of the most promising ways of thinking about the C-frame. And I was going to have a whole section about that, and then I stopped myself because I, very often people know me, I put too much, and then I take too much time. Networks, I think, a way of now going back to a lot of that and thinking about the C-frame in, in terms of the what is happening is the group dynamics understanding through, through the structure of networks. And then we have the people like Matt Jackson who is really digging into the even more technical details of how these networks operate that the conventional economic analysis of aggregating individuals and groups is not going to lead. I, I think there's a lot going on there and this is cultivating from the old work of the Barabasis and all the other people who contributed to network theory and the like. But here's the thing. And this is something that it's going to be maybe transformational. Maybe we're paying too much attention to the nodes in the networks, and maybe we should do more economics of the links in the networks. But doing economics of the links is going to be hard. Mathematically, it's going to be hard. Uh, the thinking about the economics of the nodes, it's probably the way we have been doing in many ways. But doing the econo but we are doing, for example, econometrics of the links. We are doing dyadic econometric regressions on the diets, and that's giving us much more insights in many things that are happening. But this goes back to understanding, again, the dynamics. And then, again, this is sociology working its way and keeping alive in this. So if we understand in this group dynamics how the links operate, but at the end, it's about how humans are. We are humans because we establish, we establish connections to others. It's about the connections to others, of belonging. And all those examples that I was saying, referring to, those are examples of people's connections. I have a connection with this and this and this other person, and then we can get together and say, let's build a natural fit society. Let's do a sitting on demand on this Warren chief and take him to public shaming until we take him down. Let's do this and that. That is because of connections. And sociology is a lot about connections and not as much about the, 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 the dots. So I-frame is a lot about the nodes, and C-frame is a lot about the links in the note, the links between the notes. So it's it's trying to 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 to, to travel that route of, of network and again that stands to sociology and now putting it back into the action of understanding collective action communities on the left. And and it's I think it's a promising path of work and it's going to take us along. Uh, yes. One more. One more. Yes. Okay, I'm lucky. Um, okay, do you think Right now, we're seeing these not just in the iframe, because 40 years of whatever programs we've been having, if, like neoliberalism and whatever, really just destroyed the C-frame, destroyed humanities, destroyed everything we have in terms of how we think about everyone out around us um, in a way that just is really, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of hard now Organizer. Every organizer who tried to do something in the last like, 10, 20 years knows that. But it's absolutely hard to organize 
because it's it's hard to find a group in the first place. It's hard, it's hard to find this C frame to even do something within it. Um, is that something that we can go around? Is that really just um, saying that it's uh, it's a few dollars? No, I I, 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 am, I am worried about that in, in the daily life. Uh, yeah. I have been coming to class with a hundred students course, uh, the the Econ 308, the political economy of the environment that I inherited from from G Lewis. And hundred students, and when I arrived to class, I have been shocked to see about 85 students are coming regularly. I know because I use the eye clicker, so I know how many people are responding. 85 students waiting for me to start class, and when I arrive to the classroom, because I usually arrive on time, and when I arrive to the classroom and they're sitting there, I rarely see two people talking to each other. Is this the result of COVID? Is this the result of a new way of handling things? Is this a new way of now how we deal with things, but I have been concerned about that phenomenon. Because I remember that there was a time in which we were arriving to a classroom of 100 students and we asked them to be quiet so we could start class. It's so easy to start class these days. And to me, that's worse. Just absolute silence. Each of them on the eye frame. <laughs> no, seriously. Not a single conversation between the two. The, the other class that I teach is a smaller class, and I see this growing in more and more conversations. Some of those guys are sitting here, and they have more of that. But in general, I see that. And, and it's just a reflection of that in so many other ways. Um, but, but is that, that it, somebody was the other day circulating something that was interesting about the, the third place. Uh, we had always the first place, the home, the second place, the workplace, and there should be a third place. Uh, the cafe, the, the public plaza, the place where we meet and we chat, and the disappearing of the third places is destroying that. Why? Because we have now everything at a click at our home or at a click at our workplace. And with the pandemic, we fusion the two into one and made it just one. And then the iframe light became dominant in so many other ones. So we need to fight back and see how we recover back the C frame type of, of life, of those links in the network, not only the nodes separated. So I, I agree. It's the, the fact that so many policies focus on the iframe can destroy that is one of the concerns. As I said, one of the papers in my dissertation, and this was in the year 1999, one of the papers was about the crowding out of individual taxes or penalties imposed on communities that destroy the intrinsic motivation to cooperate in the protection of the commons. Precisely in the Pacific Coast that I was doing those experiments. And so this, this concern is there. Yeah. And Jimmy's concern about the... the no, no, let's do it. I just, wanted yeah. to close us out. <laughs> I just actually wanted to make a plug for a talk that's going to be held here uh, exactly two weeks from today, in fact, on November 10th, which is about sort of the C frame, but it's really about a case study. It's called the Water Defenders, and it's about struggles in Latin America by communities to defend their rights and access to one of the most important natural resources, which is water. Um, John Cavana and Robert Broad uh, have written a book called The Water Defenders, which is about struggles of communities in El Salvador, as it happens, uh, in this respect. And they'll be here, and there'll be copies of their book here, and you're all invited. It's open to the public um, November 10th. Um, I think one of the things that will come out from that, by the way, is that very often such community movements like environmental justice movements here in the United States would be another example, arise in response to what, not to a nudge, but to what might, one might call a push. Um, they arise in response to efforts by the powerful to change the facts on the ground by appropriating resources and rights that communities believe belong to them as a, as a human right, like access to clean uh, and safe environment and water. So I think it'll be a very interesting talk, and, and I encourage you all to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
more informal conversation as one goes around to continue um, all of this. And so please join us if you want for the reception. Uh, in the atrium. Second, we're going to